understanding God's grace. Do you truly understand God's grace? We can quickly define grace as God's unmerited favor. We can use an acrostic God's riches at Christ's expense. Gathering around the Lord's table helps us understand grace because we are reminded that Jesus Christ himself is the agent of God's grace. God's grace allows us to be reconciled to him. We truly understand grace when we yield to the transformative power that accompanies it. For Paul, that happened when he realized he was the worst of sinners and stopped killing Christians and began encouraging them. He understood grace to be significant. For the rest of us, it might have been when we realized we could not save ourselves and in gratitude yielded our will to God. We understood grace is necessary. This table focuses on Jesus Christ who took upon himself the penalty for our, my sins and for yours so that we are transformed by God's grace and truly understand it. Okay, take your cup and the wafer is his body. And the juice represents Jesus' blood. Shall we pray? Dear Lord in heaven, thank you for giving us the opportunity once again to gather in your house and worship you. It is such a blessing to get together and know we have the freedom to do so. We ask that you be with the ones that are unable to be here today for whatever reason you, you know and you understand. Help us as we go through our week that our lives may touch someone that we don't even know needs help, and with your help, we can help them. Be with us as we gather through the week and guide our path. We ask this in your loving name. Amen. Rejoice and be glad. This is the day the Lord has made. I want to encourage you today. I hope you leave here today encouraged. A farmer wrote to his son in prison, I've decided not to plant potatoes this year. I can't plow the field without your help. The son responded, Dad, don't plow up the field. That's where I buried the money I stole. The next day, the police, who regularly read the inmate's mail, immediately dispatched a van load of officers to the farm. They proceeded to dig up the entire field, every square inch, but they found nothing. <laughs> the son wrote, wrote back to his dad, you can now plant the potatoes, dad. That's the best I can do from where I am. That funny story contains an important spiritual lesson. Sometimes we use difficult circumstances as an excuse for giving up and doing nothing. But this church, I'm proud to say, during difficult situations, did not give up. When we weren't meeting in the building because of Clovis, and I was preaching to empty chairs, as the message is recorded, you kept sending your tithes and offerings and you kept the church alive. Most churches had a difficult time when people don't show up, neither does their money. But we are still alive and on our way thanks to you and your faithfulness and your commitment. Ephesians 5 verse 16 reads, make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. That's what this church has done, made the most. They didn't let the circumstances decide what they're going to do. By referring to these days as evil, Paul was communicating the sense of urgency because of evil persuasiveness. We need the same sense of urgency because our days are also difficult. 
We must keep our standards high, act wisely, and do good whenever we can. We'll make the most of our time on this evil earth in fulfilling God's purpose, lining up every opportunity for worship and service. It's amazing how much we can be accomplished, even when disadvantaged, if we just change our attitude and use a little imagination and determination. Arthur J. Wallace Hamilton wrote about two country musicians whose girlfriends broke up with them within an hour of one another. One jumped off the Nashville Bridge, ended his life. The other went home, wrote a sad love story song about his broken heart, which became a hit and netted him hundreds of thousands of dollars. That's the best he could do from where he was, even though he was in a sad place. Some of the world's most successful people have stubbornly refused to be in prison by difficult situations. That's what this church has did. Refused to be controlled by the circumstances. I'm so very proud of you, so very proud of, to be a part of this church. John Grissom, the best-selling author, had his novel, Time to Kill, rejected by a dozen publishing companies who wouldn't publish it. But it became a number one bestseller across the nation. Michael Jordan, considered one of the best basketball players, was cut from the junior high basketball team and told, you'll never make it. Colonel Sanders was financially broke at age 65 before he marketed his recipe for Kentucky Fried Chicken. Bud Paxton failed at two marriages, went bankrupt three times before founding the Home Shopping Network, and now he's a billionaire. The list of successful people who refuse to be bound by their past experience seems endless. Solomon wrote, Proverbs 24, verse 16, for though the righteous fall seven times, they rise again, but the wicked stumble into calamities. We have risen again. Be proud of that. I'm proud of you, proud of that. Times of trouble can be useful. They can show us who we really are under pressure and what kind of character we have developed. In addition, they can help us grow stronger. The trouble you face today is training you to be strong for the more difficult situations you face in the future. The Apostle Paul is a great example of someone who made the most of where he was, including prison. He not only learned to be content in any circumstance, he also made the most of every opportunity, regardless of how unpleasant it seemed at the time. The apostle was thrown in jail for evangelizing in Philippi, so he converted the jailer. The apostle Paul was hauled into Caesarean court before kings and demanded, they demanded he answer the charge of inciting riots and he turned the witness stand into the pulpit and preached the gospel. The Apostle Paul was stoned outside Lystria and left there, they thought he was dead. Yet he got up, went back in the city, having gained new credibility as a martyr. The Apostle Paul was shipwrecked, stranded on an island of Malta. So he healed the sick, witnessed to the local authorities, and started a church there. The Apostle Paul was thrown into a Roman prison for a few years. So what did he do? He spent that time writing three-fourths of the New Testament from the prison. The Apostle Paul refused to be chained by adverse circumstances. Instead, he did the best he could from where he was. No wonder God used him in such a significant way. So I ask, where do you find yourself today? Are you in some kind of prison of your own making? Some circumstance making your decisions for you? Or are you trapped by circumstances beyond your control? You can't change the past, but you can change your perspective about the future. 
You can do your best from here. Ask yourself if you've lost perspective about what really matters to you. Think about how much God has blessed you with a family, loved ones, health, and the hope of the gospel. Let that pick up your spirits and do the best you can regardless of where you are. The Apostle Paul wrote from a Roman prison. Philippians 3, starting in verse 13, he wrote this from prison. I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward. That's Philippians 3, verses 13 and 14. Sometimes trying to live a perfect Christian life can be so difficult that it leaves us drained and discouraged. We may feel so far from perfect that we think we could never really please God. The Apostle Paul uses the terminology of perfection to convey the idea of being mature, of growing up. Paul had reason to forget what was behind. He had held the coats of those who stoned Stephen, the first Christian martyr. Acts 7, verses 57 and 58, notice that Paul is called Saul. It reads like this. At this they covered their ears and yelled at the top of their voices. They all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of the young man named Saul. That's Paul who hadn't been converted yet. When he was converted, he went from Saul to become Paul. We have all done things for which we are ashamed. And we live in attention of what we've been and what we hope to become. Because of our hope in Christ, however, we can let go of the past guilt and look forward to what God will help us become. Don't dwell on your past. Instead, grow in the knowledge of God by concentrating on your relationship with him. Relax that you are forgiven and move on to the life of faith and obedience. Look forward to the prize of heaven later and further and more meaningful life now because of your hope in Christ. Christian maturity involves acting on the guidance that you have already received. We may feel that we lack experience or knowledge of the Christian faith. We can always make the excuses that we still have much to learn. We should rest confidently in what we do know. God stays on the job. He will direct us. We should live up to what we already know. Live out what Christ has taught us. God will provide the plain teaching we need wherever we need to. If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 John chapter 2. Seldom does anybody preaches from 1 John chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 20 to 27. Start in verse 20. But you have an anointing from the Holy Spirit. When you became a Christian or baptized, you had the anointing. And all of you know the truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, because no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has a Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has a Father also. And for you, See, that's what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you also remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he promised us, eternal life. I'm writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As for your anointing, you received from him, remains in you. You do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remained in him. That's 1 John chapter 2. When a person becomes a Christian, he or she receives the Holy Spirit, receives the anointing. One way the Holy Spirit helps the believer in the church is by communicating truth to them, the truth about the gospel, 
God's will, his love for us. Jesus is the truth, and the Holy Spirit guides the believers for him. <clears throat> Nehemiah was God's servant, though in Persia he felt the call. God needed a special foreman summoned to rebuild the wall. The Babylonians had conquered Israel. They destroyed the city and the land. It was time to come back together, and they did by the work of God's hand. Day and night they labored and built, standing side by side as brothers. They must beware of their enemies, a tool in one hand, a sword in the other. After 52 days, they were finished. Jerusalem had its wall. The people had a celebration. Nehemiah said, now, that's not all. The wall is to protect the city. But what about your hearts? God wants them protected from the enemy. That's the most important part. Nehemiah read the scriptures, taught the people of God's word. Some of them remembered, but some had never heard. They needed to be reminded. God wanted first place in the nation. Remember David and Moses and Abraham all the way back to creation. God blessed the people's efforts, heard their cries at last. Nehemiah was obedient and completed the difficult task. When God calls you to do the impossible, and sometimes that's just what he'll do, he'll be with you every moment. His victory will be yours too. Therefore, believe in yourself. Believe you can and you will. Stay strong. Dream, believe, achieve. Never give up. A little progress each day adds up to big results. Be grateful. A grateful heart is a magnet for miracles. Work hard. Good things come to those who hustle. Stay humble. Work hard in silence. Let success make the noise. Be kind. Kindness makes you beautiful. Don't give up. Don't compare. Avoid negativity. Make peace with your past. Focus on the future. Let us pray. Dear God, we ask you to continue speaking to us. Guide us, direct us. Open our spiritual ears. We may be able to hear the Spirit, follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Help us to continue looking up to every day, even when life does not make sense. Father, do not allow the enemy to steal the joy of salvation that you have filled in our hearts. We come against strife and contention that usually crops up when people leave worship meetings. Help us to continue fixing our graze on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Lord, I pray for these that are gathered here today. Bless them. Touch them. They're good people. They're better than good. They're the best. They're totally committed. Guide them and direct them. Fill them full of you. In thy whole name we pray. Amen. <clears throat>